Welcome to the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. My name is Mark Ferguson, and I am your host. I'm a house flipper. I flip 10 to 15 houses a year. I own 13 rental properties with a goal to buy 100 by 2023. I'm also a real estate agent. I've been licensed since 01. I run a team of nine. We sell close to 200 houses a year. So on this show, we like to interview house flippers, landlords, and the best real estate agents in the business. So stay tuned for some great shows. If you want more information on my rentals, on the numbers, how I buy properties, check out investformore.com. everyone, it's Mark Ferguson with Invest For More, and welcome to another episode on the Invest For More Real Estate Podcast. Today, I've got a great guest, Tyler Sheff, who's an agent, investor, loves buy and hold, also invests in notes, and he's also a podcaster. So he's got a, a great podcast, The Cashflow Guys. So Tyler's going to come on, talk to us about what he's doing, how he helps people invest in real estate in the Florida market, and we'll learn how he got started as well. So Tyler, thank you so much for being on the show. How are you? Mark, I am tickled pink to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no, I appreciate you coming on and taking the time. First thing I always ask all my guests is to give us a little bit of background. You know, How did you first get started in real estate? What drew you into the business? For me, the first go around was I was in my early 20s and it was that lure of easy riches, so to speak. You know, that I'm going to get rich overnight. I'm going to flip houses. This will be great. Mom, look at me. <laughs> so that was my initial uh, draw to real estate. And I quickly how, realized that didn't make sense. How did that work out then? <laughs> I was going to say, did you, yeah. did you actually flip any houses or did it just, was it just kind of a pipe dream? Yeah, I would go ahead and say I flipped too many houses, to be honest with you. Uh, I was, I got, I took flipping like a drug. I used to tell people that if it was in the city of St. Petersburg, Florida, and it's yellow with white trim, I probably owned it at one time or another. We flipped a ton of properties back in the day and, uh, we made a lot of money. And that was back before flipping was sexy, so to speak. That was before home and garden television, all these other publicity things. But what I didn't allow for, Mark, is the capital gains tax. Right. Yep. And I, I do a lot of flips myself and it's definitely can eat away at a lot of the profits. What did you, so obviously you transitioned away from flipping. What kind of triggered that or how, how long did that take to get away from the flipping business? Well, I got, I was greedy at the time. I was in my, uh, when I was flipping, I was in my, I was trying to think, my late 20s. And, and now I'm 46, just to tell you how long ago that was. But I was making ridiculous money and I got greedy. And, and I knew that the market was improving at the time. It was properties were appreciating 25% per year if you did nothing. So I would buy a property and fix it up and flip it. But instead of flipping it right away, I would put a tenant in there, let them pay the rent. They would cover my holding costs for 12 months, and then I would flip the property, make 25% more upside. So I really got used to making that extra money. That was I found that to be highly attractive, doing that, going that route. That worked out quite well, of course. And right before the market crashed, purely based on greed, I am not smart enough to predict a market fluctuation or market crash. I made the mistake of selling all the properties. I say mistake, and I'll explain it in a second. I sold them all pre-crash. I made a killing uh, on selling them all, no doubt. I made a lot, a lot of money. But I thought that my charm was enough to pass the IRS. And the IRS decided that my charm wasn't enough. And I had to pay taxes, capital gains on all of that property. And since I didn't disclose all the sales, I had to pay interest and penalties at the same time. So needless to say, that caused a, that was a little damper on my, uh, my finances, so to speak. Right. I can imagine that was a pretty big... <laughs> hit to take selling um, that many properties at once. But at the same time, if you would have kept them, what do you think would have happened after with the way the market acted in Florida? Well, frankly, I think I would have been fine because I was renting them conservatively. In other words, they were more than covering my cost. I was making a monthly cash flow. The value of the properties may have gone down, but people still need a place to live and people still willing to rent places. So had I kept them and just weathered the storm, so to speak, I would have been fine because rents still didn't really go down. Even during the crash, rents actually went up a little bit. So had I not got, you know, I've got nice houses now. At the time I had nice houses. They're freshly renovated. People wanted to live there. I would have been fine if I simply did nothing. That's an interesting but, concept because I know a lot of people are super scared right now about another crash and losing a ton of money and values going down. 
but Florida was one of the hardest hit places in the in the foreclosure crisis. And to hear that you think you would have been okay, I think is a really good lesson about well, if you buy the right rental properties with cash flow, you know, getting a good deal on them, it's not the end of the world if values go down, right? Correct. Because here's the thing, Mark: Can you write a check with your? Can you pay bills with your with your equity? Of course not. You have to leverage it. So yes, you lose the ability to leverage it in a down market, or at least leverage some of it. But first of all, when a shift happens, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not an overnight thing. It takes time. There's lots of indicators, like now, for example. There's indicators saying that things may or may not shift. That said, you've got time to prepare. And if you and if you buy right, and this is my philosophy, if you buy right from day one and you get good quality financing, not some 18% hard money, something or other, but a good long-term buy and hold style financing, you'll be fine in a crash. Just don't sell when it's down. People do this in the stock market. It drives me crazy. It's like, I lost all my money in the stock market. My first question is, why did you sell? Usually nope. the answer comes down to, my broker told me to. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, I, I was flipping, I started flipping houses in 2002, 2001. The market, I'm in Colorado, the market definitely had a downturn here. But there's so many people who are just fine because like, you said they had cash flow. They, you know, some of them had loans, some did not. But if you had a loan, you know, and it wasn't 120%, you know, 100% leverage with, like you said, high interest rates, those people made it through just fine if they were smart about it. So I think it's um, kind of a misconception that every investor went bankrupt during the crash and that it was, you know, this horrible scene for everybody. But no, it's good to hear from someone who was in that area that's one of the hardest hit and that it may not have been quite as bad as people make it out to be. No, no. It was, you know, the, the media likes to sensationalize things and they get the people hyped up and get people get excited and they make they make decisions that are not based on logic. They're based on emotion. And if you're an investor and you're making your decisions based on emotion, you really need to rethink why, <laughs> your place in the investor, in the investor uh, space, so to speak. Yes, for sure. So moving on, during the crash, did you keep flipping? Did you change strategy? What happened at that point? Well, I had sold off all my property. I was out of property. I stopped flipping mainly because I didn't need to. I had plenty of money sitting in the bank and I did a lot of traveling. I would hang out and go down to the Florida Keys and hang out. And I did a ton of traveling and had, had a lot of fun. You know, I was at that age where that made a lot of sense to me. I wasn't necessarily saving money. So I was, <laughs> I was spending money. Hindsight 2020. I started a business uh, at the time doing some consulting work in the trucking industry, and I did that for a while. And then I went to go work for the federal government because basically my wife said I needed to go get a real job. Now with that, <laughs> that's the funny, here's the best part, Mark. And that was all great. I got a job, but I also got the payroll tax to go with it. Right. So what did you do th for the federal government? I worked as what they call a chief bosun's mate on a government ship. It was a research ship for the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and, and we traveled around the world on these ships, basically doing oceanographic research. So I was your typical, extremely overpaid government employee, making just under 200 grand a year at the time with overtime and benefits and all that, which created, which was great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love to travel, and that, that's, that's outstanding. But the taxes I was paying as a W-2 employee were killing me, and that's what led me back into real estate. The second time around, I call it my second act, my second time around. And what, how did that work out? What, how'd that get you into the business again? <laughs> well, for me, I was Google searching how to legally reduce my taxes because I tried it the other way and that didn't work out so good for me. Uh, after I got a six-figure tax lien against me that I had to pay off, which was very difficult, I was successfully paid that off. I decided that I wanted to do things the right way. So every Google search I came up, came back with, all led to the same path. Everybody, all the experts were saying, if you really want to eliminate or reduce your tax bill, you've got to invest in real estate. So that's what I did. But this time, everybody kept, to, you know, the Robert Kiyosaki's of the world were educating me and saying, listen, guy, here's the deal. Don't sell it this time. Just hang on to it. Buy it right. Hold on to it for the long term. And that in itself will greatly reduce your tax liability. And it absolutely did. What kind of properties did you start buying? Were they the same kind of houses you were flipping or was it more you know, multifamily? What, what properties did you hold? Well, for me, I, was, you know, I, was, I came up as a single family guy. So initially that was my knee jerk reaction is to go with a single family option. But as I kept learning more and more about it, I learned that I could scale a lot faster if I focused on multifamily. So I hunkered down and 
at the time I was working, I guess I'm still working for the government back then. I was, was making so much money. One of my immediate tax strategies was to take some of my overtime pay as compensatory time. In other words, paid time off. So I had six months of paid time off saved up. So my wife and I decided that if I could come home for six months and collect a paycheck, and we had a good feeling that I could duplicate my income not being on the ship, not working for the government, that I would go ahead and pull the trigger and quit the government job and come back home and go into real estate full time. That led to, for me, wholesaling. I got my real estate license renewed. I, I had let it expire. I, I renewed my real estate license. I was doing a lot of wholesaling, some listing and selling of, of other people's properties. But then I started buying multifamily. And how I did that, the short answer is I was able, I learned how to raise private capital. In other words, how to leverage other people's resources to make up for those that I didn't have. Now, with your, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, kind of taking a tangent here real quick. With your real estate license, there's a lot of people who say it's kind of a, a detriment to actually have it if you're an investor. I have my license too, and I think it's an amazing benefit to have it as an investor. Oh. But what is your thoughts on having your license as an investor? I think I, I don't think you. I don't, let me say this: I don't believe it's necessary to have it, but I believe it's a huge benefit. Number one, referrals alone. I made almost seventy thousand dollars in referral fees in one year. Having a podcast, people from around the country call me and say, "Hey, Tyler, do you know a realtor in Seattle?" Uh, I don't, but I'll make some calls and find out. And you know, Seattle properties sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, of which I get a referral fee. <laughs> So there's that benefit. I, the MLS access doesn't really matter to me so much, but I believe, I don't have anything to hide. I'm a, I'm a very open open book when I do business. So for me, I don't have any disclosure issues. I, I, I tell people in a, in a joking yet serious way, hey guys, the state of Florida tells me that I have to disclose to you that I'm a realtor. Some people may think that makes me smarter than you, but we both know that's not the case. So anyway, moving on. And that's that's the end of it, but I think it's a huge benefit. Yeah, no, I, I feel the same way. And I think I, I don't understand the disclosure issues for people because like you said, if you're, if you're open, you're telling the truth, there's really no downfall to being an agent. And sometimes I think it gives you more credibility with some people too, because you're licensed with the state, they can look you up, they can see you've been in business. So yeah, I completely agree with you on that side of it. Well, Mark, and you and I have something to lose. See, and that's the difference is that it doesn't make us better people because we're licensed by any means. That's ridiculous. But it does make it, we're held to a higher standard. And I think that people really don't understand the disclosure requirements. You have to disclose that you're a realtor. You really don't have to go on beyond that. Now, can you take advantage of people? No, but here's the news. You can't take advantage of people as a non-realtor either. <laughs> That's called fraud. Right. <laughs> yep, exactly. All right. So back to the your other investing. You, you began buying multifamily, leveraging other people's money. What kind of deals were you buying? Were they huge apartment buildings, smaller ones? What, what did you like to, to purchase? The first one I did was a four unit and I bought it with my VA mortgage benefits. So not only did I get it zero money down, I actually walked out of closing with a check for 1700 because I got lender credits and I had a friend of mine who was licensed. He came and quote unquote represented me, kicked the commission back into the deal. So I actually got paid to buy that four unit building. And of course that comes with a residency requirement because it's a VA mortgage. So my wife and I moved in. We renovated, renovated the fall four units real nice and then converted two out of those four units to vacation rentals, which took our cash flow through the ceiling. We really started making money when we did that. From there, we went, we started, we jumped up to the bigger buildings, the 10 to 20 unit buildings is our sweet spot. That's where we like to be. The two-story garden style brick concrete block, you know, anywhere from the 60s through the 80s. That's generally what our criteria is focused on. And you, you mentioned you don't use the MLS access that much. Are these mostly off-market deals? How do you find these properties? Generally off-market. I've done a very good job, I feel, of educating people in the marketplace that if, if you have a problem with your prop property, multifamily, whatever, I am I can usually come up with some sort of a solution that will help you out in most cases. And if I can't, there's a pretty good chance I know somebody that can't. That is my marketing. That's, that's a lot of my marketing. I spend, I do a lot of teaching in the, in the market. I speak at real estate meetings and other events to teach people. I use education as a way to bring me leads. In other words, I'll teach them for free. I educate them on how to get a good deal, which sometimes results in people in the audience going, uh oh, I didn't get a good deal when I bought this thing. And oh my goodness, I'm bleeding money. Maybe I should get rid of this thing. And then they will come to me and say, Tyler, how do I get rid of this? It's very simple. You sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and here's how we can do that. And then I give them options that suit their needs. 
No, that's that's great. And yeah, with my deals now, a lot of them are, are off market, but we still do a lot of MLS, but it's more single family homes for the flips, which is a little different than the the big apartment buildings. What do you think... What are the biggest benefits for you with going to the apartment buildings versus, say, single family rentals? Well, the ability to scale, number one. I'm in my, I'm over the hump. I'm 46 years old now. So I, for me to scale, I have to scale quicker than most people. I'm not 20 anymore. So I have to, I had to build at a faster rate. And at the single family house perspective, one of the things I was doing was, number one, I'm com- competing with every investor in my market because everybody else is single family. I'm competing with Joe Homeowner, who's willing to outspend me all day long for a property. So I found that the competition was fierce in single family. And you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm an only child. I don't like to compete. So <laughs> I would, uh, I prefer that in multifamily space, I very rarely have any competition, even on the MLS, believe it or not. Nice. I, I would not say the same thing here, but <laughs> there's a there's so much competition here and money going into multifamily in Colorado that our cap rates are around five or six percent on multifamily properties. So it's it's tough. It's it's tough to make money on rentals in Colorado as well because our values have gone up so high. But no, that, that's and you not only are you an agent and you're you're investing yourself, but you also help others invest in multifamily as well, right? I do. And what I found is that you know I've got more to bring to the equation than just, you know, pulling something off the MLS and going, hey, look at the pretty curtains. Most investors that I've run across are, are newer investors. In other words, very rarely do I meet many really experienced investors because it seems like when it comes into the multifamily space, you, usually a guy goes and gets a couple or a girl gets a couple buildings, they get confidence and then they scale pretty darn quick with multifamily. Once they figure out, especially that getting money, finding money for them is much easier. They're just easier to buy than single family houses. So once that little secret gets out, these people scale pretty quickly. What I found is that when I work with investors, I get them to the closing table, but then what? It's They fail after the closing table. So what I've done is, is started offering, and I've done this about a year ago, two years ago. I said, I will help you buy the property. And instead of me taking a fee at the closing, I'm going to record a note against the property or I will take an equity position in the deal and I will stay in the deal as an advisor in the deal. I've repositioned apartment buildings. I understand what it takes. I have the team and the resources to get it done. And if you're in an area different than mine, I can help you build that team, kind of be your person of experience in the deal and in exchange for an equity position in the deal. And that's worked out quite well. You mentioned finding money is easier for the, the multifamily properties. How is that so? What kind of financing um, are people able to get? Well, number one, you know, the value of multifamily is tied to the income it generates. And that is what makes it very different from single family homes. Single family homes, the value is tied to, well, what someone's willing to pay for it, of course, but it's also tied to comparable sales. In the multifamily space, especially with larger assets, nobody really cares what the guy down the street paid for his 10 unit building. Doesn't matter. What does matter is how much income does the property generate versus how much expenses does it incur? The ratio between those two things, like you said earlier, the the cap rate is one metric, but I'm more of a cash on cash return kind of guy. The the net profit a a building generates determines its, its marketability in the marketplace. That happens to be something that the owner has complete control over. And when you have control over the profit, the value of your property, well, how can that go backwards? It's only gonna go up. And this is what we're finding out in the marketplace is it's very difficult to lose money on an apartment building unless you simply buy it wrong. But outside of that, if you can do a lackluster job of managing and an average job of of managing it, it's going to appreciate exponentially year by year by year, even in a down market. Market can crash tomorrow. Multifamily buyers, owners will make more money when it crashes. And are you seeing banks coming in to finance these or is it private money? How did, what, where's the money coming from? The banks love to finance them. It's, it's, that's what's funny about it, Mark. It's a competition between the banks and the private lenders. In other words, private money wants to get their money moving. Okay, You're dealing with people that the, the long-term, the investors in multifamily are usually more savvy than your typical short-term hard money lenders. They see the advantage of their money moving, you know, constantly earning. So with a hard money deal with a private lender, their money's only moving once it's in a deal. And then it comes out of a deal and has to find another deal to get into. That end has very high risk. So for us raising capital, it makes it very easy because what we pitch is a very safe and practical means of investing. There's no hype with what we do. The banks 
know this. And the banks love to place their money in multifamily because it's very low risk for them. Very, very low risk. So banks will stand in line to loan money on multifamily properties. It's like they actually fight over you to, to loan money to them, which when you have that type of environment that everybody wants to give you money, well, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so on a typical deal, are, are you kind of going in and getting bank financing right away? Or are you going in with private money, trying to raise rents, increase, increase the value and maybe refinance later? Or is it just kind of a depending on the situation type of thing, what you end up financing to deal with? It, it's very situational dependent. And, and here's why I say that. Now, the, the banks, when I say the banks are standing in line to loan money, that's pretty performing buildings. If you've got a non-performing asset that's ugly, which is where I like to buy them, then the banks generally are not excited about loaning money on those because they they first thing they go they say is, well, how are we going to get paid? So in commercial real estate in a larger asset, the first thing the banks anybody looks at is how are we going to get paid if we put money in this deal? Where is our how is our money going to come back to us? And when a building is vacant with tumbleweeds rolling across it, the banks <laughs> don't like to speculate. They want more of a sure thing. So the banks are not excited about those type of properties. Where private money, on the other hand they're less likely to turn their nose up at that because they can see the benefit of of the returns, number one, and they trust a lot in the operator. In other words, if I've been doing this a while, I've got several, I own several buildings in two states. So for me, I know what I'm doing. I am what they would consider low risk. But if you're a brand new investor, then you know, yeah, it, it, you will be high risk. But Mark, here's the benefit that people, that people miss is you can leverage the experience of your team. I did one of my first deals and I got the private money because I leveraged a really experienced property management company. And the investor said, hey, if you're willing to sign a contract with this investment co- or this, in- this management company, I trust them. I know they know what they're doing. So basically what he's saying is there's very little for you to screw up, Tyler, <laughs> <laughs> because this management company is top notch. And that's exactly what I wound up doing on my first deal, my first larger deal. No, it's funny you say that because I've interviewed a, a number of multifamily guys, apartment um, complex owners, and they all say kind of the same thing. If you're brand new, if you're trying to get into the business, there's a huge barrier to entry. You know, the banks, like you said, want people who have experience. And even some of the sellers or owners of these properties, you know, may not take people serious if they've never bought multifamily before, which can make it tough. And I, they've all said the same thing, kind of, if you can partner with someone who's been in the business, in some way, it makes it so much easier to buy your first property. It sounds like that's exactly what you're saying, too. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny, having my podcast has been a huge benefit because people, I go to a, a new area, I deal with a new seller I've never dealt with before, they always question who we are. So they want to, the first thing they want to do is Google you. Well, what better resume than a hundred episodes of a podcast where you're teaching other people how to master the art of investing in multifamily for cash flow. Now they're like, Oh, well, that's a beautiful resume you got. (laughs) (laughs) And it makes it very easy to qualify in that case. So absolutely. Very cool. Um, As an agent, are you still doing any kind of traditional real estate listing or helping, you know, buyers buy regular houses or is it just focused on kind of the the apartment building um, investing? I do. My wife is a residential agent. She's as a, she, obviously she's an investor because I am too. But she does a lot of the residential stuff. I like to do the high end. I'll sell the high end flip properties. I've learned quite a bit about marketing, and I feel I'm pretty talented when it comes to marketing. I like to get in front of a camera and, and act a fool and draw people to a property. So I do. I've got a couple of listings right now, actually, uh, in the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar range. I do still, still like dabbling that stuff. I don't necessarily like to work with quote unquote retail buyers unless they're a referral from a past client. I will work with them then, but I don't actively seek new buyers unless they are buy and hold investor buyers. Oh, good to know. A lot of our audience are, are agents or thinking about becoming agents. So I just uh, like to get insight from those who are already agents about the business and what they're doing now. If someone, let's say someone's an investor now, maybe they're flipping or have buy and hold properties, whatever it is, and they're thinking about going full time into real estate. I mean, is becoming a real estate agent, along as with it being an investor, a good way to kind of supplement your income to get into real estate full time? It's an absolutely a great way to supplement your income. And here's the biggest benefit that people all often miss is that it keeps you immersed in the business. In other words, if you're out working at Starbucks or something while you're trying to be a real estate investor, you're focused on coffee eight hours a day. 
You're not focused on real estate. But if you're a real estate agent, you're focused on real estate 8, 10, 12 hours a day. You're immersed in the industry. And even if you're selling single family houses, condos or mobile homes, whatever it may be, you're still in the industry, which means you're spending time with lenders and, and buyers and sellers. And I've met my capital investors, Mark, at bank-owned open houses. I went and sat at a bank-owned open house, walked out with seven figures in investment capital. Yeah, no, I was, I was gonna, just going to mention the network power of being an agent is amazing too. I have other agents bring me deals. Like you said, the lenders you meet, title companies, even insurance agents. I mean, just the people in the business when they know you're an investor can be such a great resource for building your business. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think being investors, it makes us better negotiators as agents. So for me, uh, you know, I, I automatically get higher commissions than most of the other agents in my market. Because to me, those little numbers are, they're not intimidating, which means I have no problem saying seven, eight, nine, ten percent 10%, or I need 35000 to do to sell this property. That, that doesn't that doesn't sound like a lot of money to me because I'm used to playing with bigger deals because I'm not concerned about it. Other people around me, i.e. the people paying the bill, are not concerned about it either. So for me, that just makes it easier to get higher higher listing commissions, which means I can pay, pay the buyer's agents more money, which means my listings sell on average faster than everybody else in the market. No, that's a, that's a really interesting strategy because as you know, right now, there's a huge push about lowering commissions and online companies, you know, charging less and agents getting paid too much. But it, when the market wasn't quite as hot here, we were actually paying you know, higher commissions to buyer agents as well to give our properties a, a, an edge. And I think you know, sometimes doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing can be a good thing. So it's, it's good to hear that you've been doing that and it's been successful. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you pay people well, they will perform. That's basic, basic common sense. And that's exactly what we do. I've got listings right now where I'll pay three and a half, four percent and I'll give you a $3,000 bonus if you bring me an offer by the end of the month. And guess what? People bring me offers by the end of the month. <laughs> That's great. And I have not seen the bonuses for a while. You know, I, I was an REO broker. Actually, I still am technically, but there's no foreclosures in Colorado anymore. And a lot of the banks would offer those bonuses to agents when the market was down. But that's really disappeared since things have gotten better. So I, I'm sure that sets you so far apart when you can offer a bonus on a property for other agents. Oh, it absolutely does. It, it makes all the difference in the world. And especially with condos, the other listing agents hate me at condos, especially when there's several on the market. They're like, oh, geez, really? You got to pay four when I'm <laughs> we're offering two and a half or two? Yep. Right. No, that's that's great. That's um, great information there. Tyler, we've gone over quite a bit about you know your investing the multifamily properties, you're flipping, being an agent. What about your podcast? You know, how did that get started? What are you mostly talking about on there? How, how's that going? You know, the podcast started because when I got back into real estate investing, Mark, I suddenly discovered that you can very easily spend $150,000 learning how to buy a $50,000 house. And I thought, you know, that really doesn't make much sense to me. Who would spend, and the answer is a lot of people, who would spend $150,000 in, in quote unquote training to learn how to buy a $50,000 house? Heck, I'm a realtor. I can show you how to buy a house and you don't even have to pay me. So the podcast became a way for me to teach other people to do what I'm doing. And it, it was also a way for me to stay accountable. In other words, I can't go on the show and say one thing and do another. So I teach people how to do it right, which keeps me in check because I'm human and I'm lazy American like anybody else. And I can fall off the wagon real quick and start doing things the wrong way, the lazy way, the easy way, therefore fail. The podcast, that was the number one reason for me is to keep me accountable. Number two, to help people learn because I really, I'm a big believer and it sounds cliche, but this is a fact. If you give to the marketplace, and I've proven this time and time again, if you give to the marketplace, the marketplace will give to you. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And it has. The market's been very, very good to me. I believe that's because I'm a big believer in karma. It's good karma. You know, I, I always take care of people. I look out for people. Sometimes they don't do the same for me, but over and above, I have an abundance mentality. And my show is about that. It's not about getting you to the next guru course. The other advantage for me with my show was the fact that I needed to position myself in the marketplace as an expert. You know, I could run an ad saying, hey, I'm an expert. And they could either choose to believe it or not. But I'm more of a don't tell me, show me. Does that make sense? Yes. No, that's, that's kind of the same. A lot of the reasons I did my podcast as well, just because my audience asked for one. <laughs> but uh, no, it really right. does hold you accountable. The, the blog, you know, I can write about all these things, like you say, but if I'm not doing any of it, 
then people won't pay attention to you. But if you're actually doing it and writing about it and showing people, it just gives you a lot more credibility. And I'm, I'm exactly the same way as far as, you know, the abundance mentality, you know, spending time actually planning and working on yourself, you know, not just always being about business and, and making money, but, you know, making sure that your own mental health is healthy as well. So yeah, I'm a huge believer in all of that as well. And I, I would say almost every successful person I interview is the same way too. It's, it's crazy how many people have that same attitude when they're successful and you start to see patterns like, oh, maybe there's a connection between the two. There definitely is. There definitely is. And I've seen the same thing, exact same thing. Tyler, I, I, that's all I had from my side of it. I, I, before we get out of here, um, if somebody wants to start investing, you said you work with a lot of beginners. Um, maybe they're in a market like Colorado or California where it's so hard to buy cash flowing properties. What are some tips for them? How can they get started in another area where there might be cash flowing properties? First thing is there is opportunity in every market. There is opportunity in, in LA and the in, when people say there's no deals, there are deals in, in Manhattan, in New York City. You have to spend time looking where other people are not. In other words, the, there are opportunities in front of everybody's face right now as they listen to the show. They just have yet to learn how to discover them. So take some time, find some people that are ed- doing it, that are educating, and people that are actually have that people that have actually done the work. Listen to, in very carefully to when they're selling you some sort of education, what do they have to show their track record? What proof do they have that they've actually done the work and they've done like yourself, you're an agent, you've done lots of deals. You're a guy that, that you would want to learn, that I would want to learn from because you've done, actually been out in the field, roll your sleeves up, you do the work. That's a huge difference between, between the marketing company that just pitches some course that they've changed the cover and it's the same tired information over and over again. So certainly educate and yourself and look in your own market. Try not to stray all over the country and get shiny object. Focus on your own market. You will discover opportunity. Awesome. No, great advice. If people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way they can reach out or listen to your podcast? How can they find you? The best way to get me is through cashflowguys.com. That's my main website, cashflowguys.com. On there, I've got my videos. I've got tutorial videos. It's all free. I've got my podcast. is on there. You can listen to it there. You can listen to iTunes, Stitcher, you name it. I'm easy to find and the information, most of what I put out there is for free. I do have some paid courses and whatnot, but uh, I have a lot of information for free. So get out there and consume some of that. That's why I do it. And I've also got a YouTube channel. Awesome. And I I guess one last thing before we go, what market in Florida are you focused on? Where are you buying most of your properties? Most of mine are in the, most of my, my focus is in Memphis, Tennessee and Tampa Bay, Florida. So I'm in the Tampa area in Florida. And of course, Memphis, Tennessee, I've got properties in both both areas, both markets. Okay. Nope. That always helps. So (laughs) cool. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. A lot of great information. Um, Love to hear the agent side from people who are investors as well. And um, yeah, hopefully people can check out your podcast as well and see what you're doing over there. And um, yeah, we'll have to keep in touch. And thank you again. Thank you, sir. Have a great one. 